Hello and welcome to day three of the World Cup Minute. My name is Josh. I'm here with Brandon. Brandon, how are you? Josh, we are recording from our respective offices. This is Let's like just say this... undisclosed locations. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're recording from undisclosed locations that may or may not have more ambient noise than than our home bases. And uh, I am feeling a little hoarse from yesterday, screaming at the TV during that yes. U.S. Wales match. How are, how's your voice doing? Great. I'm doing yeah, fine. you sound great. I, yeah, you sound yeah, great. I'm I'm much younger than you, so that might be a factor there, Brandon. You know, <laughs> just <laughs> just general wear and tear those, on my vocal yeah, cords. Right? Yeah, exactly. Those those extra three years make a huge difference. Uh, no, I'm feeling I'm feeling okay. I did, um, and this is probably going to be a recurring problem for me. Is I didn't sleep super well last night because mm-hmm. I woke up kind of early this morning. Um, because I just I knew this art that Argentina game was on and like in the back of my head it was like a kind of it was like when I started to stir a little bit I was like well, let me just check the score real quick yeah. and uh, this is you know six thirty in the morning or whatever a little earlier than I typically wake up and I looked and I was like wait Saudi Arabia is winning this game two mm-hmm. one and once you see that Argentina is losing to Saudi Arabia there's basically no going back you don't like you don't roll over and fall back asleep after that no you want to know more. You definitely want to know more. Yeah. And uh, it was definitely a day for, uh, I mean, it's been a World Cup of star men taking pens, many of them converting like Gareth Bale and Lionel Messi. And then we'll get to Robert Lewandowski and how he kind of let Poland down by missing his pen opportunity against Mexico. But, I mean, right out of the gate, the theory I came up with in yesterday's World Cup Minute, Josh, was that This was going to be a World Cup of the great teams being greater than expected and the bad teams being worse than. Hmm. And today, I think day three was one of the hardest ones to predict. I mean, especially when Australia went 1-0 up against France, you thought, well, is this going to be the most remarkable uh, World Cup ever where the the cats sleeping with dogs, Mm etc. France did right the ship, and uh, that's a pretty straightforward narrative there, but... Yeah. How are you feeling about these results writ large? Yeah, I feel like one catastrophic upset is is enough for one day, right? Like you get you get a bunch of them, and you're like, okay, so is this even like, are they even at their best? You know what I mean? It's, it starts to like rewire your thinking a little bit. But one upset is perfect because that makes you feel like yeah. anything can happen right now. And so, yeah, I mean the the two the two nil nils were matches that uh, in both cases were were not shocking nil nils. I mean, we can just get right into the matches if you want. We yeah. Well, let's start off with those nil nils because they're maybe the the easiest ones to talk about. I mean, I think the Denmark Tunisia game was, you know, it was kind of interesting. I mean, just I wonder if Tunisia is actually the team that might be a little more disappointed uh, from that match. Uh, Dem- mm-hmm. Denmark was certainly favorite going into it. Um, our beloved Danish dynamite, Brandon. But uh, bang, bang. You know, yeah, from what I was able to to gather, this is like you know. Uh, like you said yesterday, this it's it's trickier when there's there's eight hours of matches on. You really have to sort of, you know, be be delicate <laughs> yeah. with your time and then, you gotta and then budget hopefully... it out, don't you? Exactly. Yeah, I, I recommend. By the way, this is a free advert for for YouTube TV. I, I highly recommend it because they can just record they record all of these yeah. and then you can look at your phone and you can actually just rewind the little <laughs> the little t- you know ticker and you can go back and watch. Everything that just happened. So that's what I did this morning with the Saudi Arabia matches. I, I just I re- went and rewatched mm-hmm. the two goals. The second Saudi Arabia goal, by the way, if you have not seen it, is yes. a spectacular <laughs> goal. It's really wonderful. The the goal is spectacular. Wholeheartedly agree. The reaction videos around social media are equally fantastic. <laughs> I saw yeah. one video of this uh, Saudi family, a bunch of guys gathered around the TV. The goal goes in. Everyone loses their mind. The door to the house is like the front door. It's open. And some guy is so excited, he actually rips the door off of his hinges and carries it (laughs) outside of the house. Um, Just like people going off. You love to see it. It's great, and this is what makes the World Cup so so special, obviously. And I think what what's what's great too is that uh, you know when we think about Saudi Arabia, certainly the way we have been talking about it on the podcast, it's Saudi Arabia as the kind of you think of these sort of family right and this sort of exec like the whatever you want to call the sort of people at the top um and you for like it's not that you forget but it's just like you know the way that it sort of impacts us typically is their ownership of newcastle for example Mm -hmm. and then you watch this match you're like right it's but these people who just were born there you know they're just they're just people and they're they love football and to see them excited and there was a shot of this fan uh in the stands who uh, at the end of the whistle was just crying into his flag and 
I just totally get that. I, you know, I, I totally yeah. understand how you would just be so overwhelmed that you would. And it was just, it's very heartening to see this kind of stuff. It's what makes this such a special thing. And I, I feel like for like last week, I'm, I'm not, I, I've decided that I'm actually really glad that there was no lead up to um, the World Cup except for one week because it was all bad news last week. It was like every piece of new news that broke yeah. <laughs> was, it was, oh. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's live door. broadcasting, um, folks. You never know who's going to yeah. pop in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry that threw yeah, me we'll, off. We'll, yeah, we'll bit. save that. Yeah. We'll save that guest for later. Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. The, the, <laughs> the getting completely overwhelmed um, by by the scenes, and that's why we would encourage people who are like, coming to the World Cup and soccer through the World Cup is try to get out there and watch matches with other people. I'm probably less likely to cry at a result if I'm sat alone on my couch in, in my yeah. apartment. But yeah, the the you you were also hinting at like the uh the cascade of bad news last week leading up. I mean the the bad news hasn't stopped since the World Cup started. No the uh, the rainbow, the, the, the rainbow band. armbands and that's just yeah. like in, inexcusable. I really hope that yeah. Um, people, uh, you know, Harry Kane to pick him out of the the lineup. I hope that he's heard enough of the people say, just take the yellow card. That would be actually important. Yeah. Um, I would like to see some yellow cards being given out during the next round. Yeah, or just make, yeah, just pick some player who's very not likely to get a yellow. Make make Mason Mount the captain at the start of a game <laughs> or something. Or, you know, or, or even better, bring someone on as the captain and then sub him in the first minute. That would yeah. be a real powerful statement so maybe they'll do that right. in the third match or something if they if they yeah. win um right. the first two so I mean, cool. hopefully, hopefully they don't uh win that second match winning because that's that's uh the, against us on friday uh, but yeah the denmark tunisia game I, I you know in mexico poland the only thing about mexico poland was that it was probably the best result for argentina if one of those teams had won today i feel like that would have made things a little tricky for argentina but with that draw they're probably fine. They just need to win their next two. If they even win one and draw one, they should they should be able to go through. And yeah, I mean, I think Ochoa, just the legend himself. Like, I don't know how he's never made his way over to the Premier League. It's, it seems like every time I see him, he's like standing on his head. You know, he's spectacular. An incredible tournament goalkeeper. I mean, the, the, it, it aroused memories of Jorge Campos, who was the previous iteration of, of Ochoa, like a very memorable tournament keeper for. Mexico, and I'll just jump ahead to Kit Talk, Josh, which is my favorite <laughs> section of the podcast. And yeah. Mexico, they continue to crush it in the Kit department. You know, the vibrant green with the the red Adidas stripes, just just so iconic. And they've got a, a good fit for this World Cup. Well done to Adidas there. Uh, but I I think it, it's some people want the narrative to be. I want to know exactly who the favorite is for the World Cup after the first round of fixtures. It's it, like having some question marks is fun. Like there are plenty of nations who have won the World Cup after losing their opening match or drawing their opening match. So mm -hmm. this this kind of just ratchets ratchets up the uh, the intrigue a little bit to see these these results. And now Argentina have a hill to climb. And there's, you know, they they have every uh, way of climbing that hill. Wow, what a what a beautiful metaphor that is, Brandon. Yeah, I've been you listening know, to so. a lot of Kate Bush recently, Josh. <laughs> if you can't tell. Uh, and then you talk about good teams sort of being good, Brandon. I, I think with France, Australia, right? Australia, uh, you know, sucker punches them right at the start, mm -hmm. and then France says, "Okay, yeah, we're actually uh, way." better than you and they sort of ran over australia for the rest of the match it was uh, you know this this one i was actually able to watch a little more of and it was um yeah unsurprisingly really one side and you forget even with benzem out this team is just incredibly loaded and and honestly olivier Giroud is just everything he does is sort of he like it's it's like his skill set is like the same at twenty five as it is at thirty six or whatever. You're right. Yeah. There's you know it's like you know holds up the ball, uh, can set up, set up his teammates, almost scored. I do remember this, Brandon. In episode one of this podcast, I said I wanted a a scissor kick that bounced off the ground mm -hmm. into the net, and I almost had it. I what well, the, the missed by about three inches today. It was such a heartbreaker. Yeah. Uh, but you know he he scored. He looked um, he looked terrific. Obviously. Um, I mean, you know, it was, that team is just, I mean, Rabio uh, with the opening goal, it was, just, it was just a really dominant performance, I felt like, once they sort yeah. of, um, you know, centered themselves after that opening goal from Australia. 
Yeah, and uh, Giroux with the brace, you know, he's right up there with uh, Ender Valencia now in the Golden Boot race. But I think we talked about the absence of Kareem Benzema. It does just open the door for a guy like Giroux, and and a team as stacked as is France. You know, injuries uh, aside, they still have just like tons of great talent and. All yeah. that skill set you were outlining there of Giroud, he, he has the ability to let the other players around him shine. It yeah. is like specifically that hold up play up front. Just just get the ball up to Giroud, he'll hold it up and let somebody yeah. like Mbappe run onto it, and he's clear through goal. Yeah, I mean, and we I think he scored that that the his his second goal, the fourth goal of the match. I think he scored it with his ear because uh, when that went in, he immediately collapsed. Did the Giroud starfish, which he sort mm-hmm. of is sort of famous for in the Premier League, just you know, mm-hmm. on his back with arms and legs splayed. Yeah, uh, we we saw that a lot. Usually, usually after, after he's before, missed so. an opportunity, though, Josh. Yeah, exactly. Uh, He's rewritten his. Uh, I yeah. I love him now. I, I think he's, yeah. you know. So um, yeah, great, uh, yeah, great story. I mean, is Giroud underrated, overrated, properly rated? Uh, someone suggested our, our friend uh, Dan Parsons asked on Twitter that it's all of the above. That mm-hmm. he is somehow probably. I mean, maybe maybe he's, he's a combination of underrated and properly rated. I'm not sure that he's he's overrated necessarily, but yeah. um, just an easy player to like. And I I think that team is just it just it kind of has it all. I mean, um, I, I think you have to sort of. They have reaffirmed the idea that they are one of the you know three or four teams that are most likely to win the World Cup. I really felt good about them coming out of today's matches. Any more thoughts on you know? Then one, by the way, we're we're going to try to go back to the idea is that we're actually going to do these in like twenty minutes and not go insanely long every single time. So, yeah. on anything, any thoughts on the on the nil nils? Any thoughts on you know before we move on to the kind of winners and losers for today? Yeah, I think it just has to come back to our Argentina. I think they remain kind of one of the more interesting teams of today because yeah. Saudi Arabia, uh, yeah, they'll be high, but Argentina, will they be able to respond to a, a blow like this, losing this match? And as we kind of tried to stress, yeah. it's not as big a blow as it may feel like today for Argentina fans. But, you know, Messi and this, you know, his na- his versions of the national teams – they have a tendency, like when things aren't going their way, to, to collapse a bit. So I'm very curious to see what kind of mentality we get from Argentina. I'm curious, too. I mean, it's, you know, I, they did win the Copa America last year, which maybe I thought it would maybe uh, erase some of the demons, some of the World Cup demons yeah. that seems to have been haunting them for, I don't know, like more than a decade. Uh, even though they made the World Cup final, you know, <laughs> yeah. in the Brazil, it still feels like it didn't change anything. Maybe because that World yeah. Cup final was such a... That was kind of a bummer of a match. I, when I think back on that match, it was just kind of a – nobody really grabbed that one, you know, yeah. by the scruff of its neck. And it's certainly not Messi, who really still doesn't have that kind of international stage moment, unfortunately. I feel like even winning the Copa America last year, it kind of felt like it was Emmy Martinez's Copa America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he was so so great in that uh, that tournament run. That was the Mario Götze game winner for Germany, wasn't it? it? Was. And yeah, it's um, – yeah came on as a as a super sub and then and uh, sure let it it again isn't it? what a Your what a combination sure that's like <laughs> full of full of legend <laughs> that's like getting larry bird and jordan on the same basketball team it's just incredible <laughs> stuff yeah so that's day day three uh intriguing to say the least and uh, yeah. uh how, how does that set us up for tomorrow yeah, I mean tomorrow we're we're now you know we're now officially on this this schedule of uh, four four matches a day. Uh, kicking things off, we have Morocco Croatia at five o'clock in the morning. It's a fun match. I was looking at the Croatia team, and it's it's remarkably similar to the Croatia squad that we saw in twenty eighteen. I mean, it's just uh, the question is just does it matter that everybody's like four years older? I mean, with someone like Luka Modric, I'm not sure it does really matter that much, right? He's still he's brilliant. ageless, yeah, yeah. And obviously we have. Uh, uh, I don't know. Like I, I think, I think you know, the Morocco is a little more of a, of a question mark. I mean, they're they're of all the African countries, they're considered you know one of the teams that really has a chance to to maybe do a little bit of damage. So I'm I'm really curious to see how they how they play. I mean, they have Hakim Ziyech, who again you've got to like take off your Premier League glasses. Like I sort of mm-hmm. see him as the this Chelsea disappointment. But a lot of these players, when they're in their national teams, it's it's a whole different story, right? You've got to kind of throw away their club football record. And so, um, I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, on that opening match today or tomorrow? Yeah. I, I, I don't have any huge thoughts other than just kind of bring it on. Uh, the, as you, as you said, the Croatia team has not changed much since 2018 and 
do you do you think that they feel like they have unfinished business? Just doesn't strike me as the team yeah. that has unfinished business. They kind of made their they made they their statement, their, right? Yeah, I agree. They finished their business, and yeah, uh, yeah and Modric won the Ballon d'Or. Like I don't know, that's like pretty pretty good. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that that was like yeah, making the final. I think was was a quasi victory for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that brings us to uh, Germany, Japan, and. I mean, this group, the Group E, is really interesting. It's a Germany, uh, Germany, Spain, Japan, and Costa Rica are all in that group. And, of course, Germany and Spain are the, are the two favorites. But it wouldn't shock me if one of those two clubs didn't make it through. Uh, not feeling hugely confident in Costa Rica, but Japan, maybe. They might have a shot. Yeah, I mean, Japan had a good result against the U.S. Uh, in the build-up to the World Cup and in, in the friendlies. This this Spain team, speaking of teams that, unlike Croatia, may have unfinished business, Spain, they, they kind of flirted with success in the Euros uh, last summer. And they have a lot of interesting players and some players who... Like, their story's not totally written. I mean, uh, Morata up, up front for Spain particularly jumps out to me. Like, a player who is perennially disrespected for not being able to rise to the to the sure. uh, the crowning moments. Well, and, it's perfect because uh, you've got Kai Havertz on the other side, too, right? I mean, the, yeah. Germany and Spain are both lead the lines with, with players that are honestly, like, fairly... Yeah maligned and I, I think what's interesting about both these clubs is that they're they they both feel like nations in transition. Like their football teams feel like they're in transition. Mm-hmm. They, Spain I mean of course in Spain and Germany two teams that have both won the World Cup in the last fifteen years and that Spanish team from two thousand ten it was so perfect. I mean, it was basically like a perfect team. Uh, they would have beaten probably any team in the World Cup this year. They were, they were brilliant. And um, I don't know. I mean, well, I, don't, I was pretty impressed with France today, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's let's see how Brazil looks. Uh, yeah. I think they play tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of... I think they play on Thursday, actually. Uh, I think there's... Um, so it's hard to say. Like, it doesn't feel like there's that kind of one superstar on either club that's going to just sort of propel them to victory. There's not even like that kind of Luka Modric sort of brilliant playmaker that's going to connect everything and make it happen with either of these two squads. I will say with Germany, I'm very excited about their wide players. Serge Gnabry uh, at Bayern Munich, he's A, one of the coolest looking professional footballers for my money. And then Leroy Sané on the other side. And it's, it's like all Bayern Munich in the midfield. For Germany, you'll have Goretzka and Kimmich also starting yeah. for Germany, presumably. And yeah. there will be a degree of, of chemistry there where there may not be with the sure. Spanish side. Uh, I mean, we keep talking like like Spain is playing Germany tomorrow. They're not. <laughs> right. But these are kind of like things to, <laughs> things to look out for, players to look for. Like, I think if these key players have good form... Um, like, yeah, that that will tell you, uh, give you a clearer picture of who we think is going to top this group. I do love that Joel Campbell for Costa Rica is now in what, like his 12th World Cup. Like this, mm. this guy, is he still on loan from Arsenal? It's like, it's like <laughs> yeah. year 17 of being on. Somebody on lost loan. that loan paperwork and he's just like, <laughs> he's probably no longer on the payroll. He just thinks he still has to keep showing up for work. <laughs> There's a handful of Premier League players kind of scattered across uh, across. Well, certainly, obviously, the Spanish and German teams both have that. And uh, Ferran Torres uh, doesn't play for for Spain anymore. But I I, I love Ferran Torres. I think he's a uh, you know really really fun and easy player to, to fun and easy player to root for. I don't know. I mean, yes. he plays for Barcelona now. Brandon, is that? I feel like once you in, like once you go to like the biggest club, they, you know, or whatever <laughs> they are. I don't even know. Yeah, a uh, famous club. A famous club. One of the two biggest clubs. I'd, mm-hmm. I'd say along with. Along with Real, but I, I think that the, the Spain the Spain team is kind of easy to root for. There's a lot of players I like in there, and then Germany. I mean, they have uh, Antonio Rudiger, who I just find impossible to root against as well. I just I don't know what it is about Rudiger. Rudiger root just, against? Yeah, I, I hear you. Against. I don't know <laughs> what you mean. What is it about him? It's just he, he just seems cool, right? It's like he's kind of he's like lanky and sort of like he's just well, there's some, yeah. sort of his style. Of play. His style is very much uh, he kind of makes it look easy. He also yeah. makes it look like he's enjoying himself to a degree yeah. and. Yeah. You know, you, you're used to center backs like Virgil van Dijk, who, you know, he, he should basically be wearing a hat that says genius at work or something like that. You're like, OK, buddy, like, <laughs> like maybe take your foot off the gas a little bit here. And Rudiger is just out there saying, like, you could do that, but also um, smile from time to time. I like, uh, by the way, the U.S. has a Tim Ream. The Germans have another defender, David Rahm. So it's Ream, Ream versus Rom, Brendan. I hope they meet up uh, in one of the elimination matches. Yeah, we'll uh, find then, out if it's Reamstein yeah. or Romstein. Uh, <laughs> well, time will tell. 
Uh, and then the final match tomorrow is Belgium, Canada. And I am really excited about this. So, you know, for anyone who's not in the United States listening to this podcast, uh, Thanksgiving weekend is, um, th- or this week sort of begins our, our Thanksgiving week. And uh, I'm off tomorrow, Brandon. So I am very excited about watching this uh this Belgium Canada match. I mean, it's what the World Cup's all about, right? Like Belgium yeah. Canada. Like not a, not a friendly I would necessarily be like glued to in you know in in June. But yeah. oh my gosh, am I excited about this match tomorrow? And speaking of that kind of the, that that playmaker that's missing from Spain and Germany is there on Belgium, right? Can can Kevin De Bruyne have this sort of Luka Modric level mm-hmm. run? That yep. he's in great form, um, brilliant player in the prime of his career. If it's going to happen, it's it's got to be this tournament, right? Yeah, and that's an apt comparison because people have kind of lost faith in the Belgian squad. They're they're at the tail end of this golden age, and remarkably like uh, gifted, accomplished players like from Eden Hazard and Romelu Lukaku, uh, who will lead the line with De Bruyne. But you know, everyone I think is kind of sick of of Belgium being the hipster pick, and they've not been able to get it done so they will need yeah De Bruyne a la Modric in 2018 to just put this team on their on his shoulders and see what he can do and he will have to do it against probably the best Canadian player in in the history of that nation's program uh Davies yeah exactly and uh you know going back to uh Bayern Munich he completes that Bayern Munich um um I don't know, Where's, squat, whatever. I backed myself into a rhetorical yeah. corner there. But Where's yeah. Junior Hoylet, Brandon? Junior <laughs> Where Hoylet, is he? Where he is didn't he? crack this team? Outrageous. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'm very curious to see. I, I'm, I'm excited to see this. I mean, this Canadian team, they haven't been in a World Cup since, I don't know, since uh, pre, pre, pre-war pre era, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, Prediction for tomorrow, Brandon, just looking at this this Belgium defense right now. we got Toby Alderweireld and... Jan Vertonghen, you got the, the, the Spurs quasi legends there, uh, Tim Castagna. I, I'm predicting at least one Canadian goal. Okay, so mm-hmm. if you're if you're if you're doing a, if you're betting tomorrow a Canada Belgium both teams to score bet, I think was a, is a very strong bet for for tomorrow's match. I think this could be um, one of the more high scoring matches we've seen in the World Cup so far. Yeah, and I think what defined Canada through the qualification process in CONCACAF, and because we're Americans, we saw a fair few of these Canadian matches, they had a certain swagger and confidence during that qualifying oh, yeah. that makes me feel like they're not going to be overawed by this occasion and they're going to come to play. So, yeah, I think this is going to be a really fun game. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I'm really looking forward to uh to all the matches tomorrow, and I'm glad that the 5 a.m. one is not one. I would say the, the match I'm least excited about is the earliest one, so thank goodness for that. Uh, and, yeah, I feel like we're going to get out of the match prediction game here too much because I I just, you know, we're, we're let's keep our eyes open, Brent. I think mm-hmm. as the stakes, as we get, as, as the stakes become clear, as everyone has one match in, I think it'll be a little easier for us to kind of get a sense of what we might see in these matches. But after uh, Saudi Arabia, Argentina today, it feels like... Uh, I don't know, it's just perfect. I feel like, you know, in terms of, like, winners and losers for the World Cup so far, um, I just think as a fan experience, it's been spectacular. Even as a as an American fan who had a draw that felt like a loss, it just feels like we really, um, I don't know, it's just been super fun so far, right? I mean, no complaints yeah. for the actual matches. Yeah, and how about, I'm just going to go for it and say I'm rooting for Morocco to win that opening match because uh, no African team has posted three points yet. So uh, mm. I'm pulling for you, Morocco. Let's go. Let's go, Team Continent of Africa. There you go. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, and I guess that was kind of cool. That was the cool thing about Saudi Arabia, too, right? Is that you had a Middle East team that was able to, mm-hmm. to post three points early on, too. Yeah. So, um, all right, well, that's your World Cup minute for today. We'll see you tomorrow and uh, enjoy tomorrow's matches.